Alrighty then, uh, I guess uh, one, two, three, boom, welcome to a brand new Lockdown Trenches episode, actually. <laughs> uh, hey Federico, how's it going? How is the lockdown in Italy going? Hi Marco. Well, uh, we're currently in what we call the red zone. It is not uh, a lockdown like the other year, the last year, but we still cannot go out of our homes without a reason. Uh, a curfew at 10, we can just go to work right. or for grocery or to do health stuff. Right. But uh, no one at home, uh, no visits. Uh, it sounds harsh. Let, let, let's see if we can actually make life a bit better with our interview today. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about this a couple uh, of weeks before, actually, but uh, just for the folks outside listening, uh, what's the company called you're working for and what do they do? Yeah, I work in Antea in Italy and we build software for oil and gas companies. We, we focus on uh, uh, managing the plants um like scheduling all the tasks that need to be done maintenance tasks checks uh inspections and so on so when you, when, when you say uh these tasks all plans are we talking about you have some some web application and then maybe even some embedded application controllers doing something or what exactly what kind of software exactly are you working on our software is a, a web application uh, we're not doing a uh, process control, so no checks on production or um, activating valves and so on. Uh, we schedule things that people do, um, maintenance tasks and, and so on. And right. that is a, a large web application that focuses on actually on many uh, different fields of the, um, uh, of the plants like pressure, vessels or the electrical parts or uh, instruments that read uh, values or sewerage networks also right does it actually matter is it's a difference between uh, like oil plants and gas plants so is it ba ba literally the same what the software does yeah for us they are exactly the same we also cover uh, oil platforms offshore for example and the management of these things are is the same both onshore and offshore for what regards the, what we do. All right. And uh, just quickly, what's your role? What do you do again? I am the head of software development in Antea. So my main purpose is being sure that other people may work at their best. <laughs> right. It makes sense. Um, when you say a big software, um, web application in terms of are we talking about it's also like 10 years old or 15 is this a big legacy application or is it basically a, a rewrite what what does it what does it look like well um the entire platform that is the name of our application is is well it passes 10 years actually and it also is a rewrite of our legacy application that currently is still uh, being maintained because we have a lot of customers that still rely on the older version. Uh, you know, probably uh, oil and gas is quite slow in adopting and in changing to new technologies and so on. So we have to maintain old version for a long, long time. Right. Understand. And how, how many people would you say are working on this in total? How many developers are working on this in total? In Antel, we have uh, 15 developers. Mm -hmm. um, three of them work on, uh, still work on the, uh, the legacy version that is a native Windows application. And the other dozen developers work on the, on the Antel platform. And to get this right again, the native Windows application is basically even older than those 10. So the 10-year-old yeah. software you're working at the moment is the rewrite, basically, and the, the Windows version is maybe two decades old or whatever. Um, it has its roots in uh, 1989, actually, in a very old DOS version. Right. It was ported to Windows and in the mid-90s, I think. And uh, this is, uh, and the entire platform is actually so the, the third incarnation of the software. And it covers a lot of more um, use cases and has a lot of more features than its previous uh, versions. Right. What, what technologies are you using? What frameworks, technologies, programming languages, and that sort of stuff? 
Yeah, the entire platform is a full stack Java web application. So we have uh, Spring Boot and Hibernate um, at the ground level, then uh, and at the middle tier also. And we use Vadin for the um, front end, the web user interface. Yeah. Right. Did you ever think about did, was Vadin your first choice, or did you uh, experiment with something else before, or was the front end always the same? Yeah, the, 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 the front end was always written in Vadin. We started with the entire platform at the time of Vadin 6. And then we moved to Vadin 7, 8, and we will begin to move to uh, 14 in the next month. Uh, it was a difficult choice <coughs> because at that time, um, Antel was quite investing, investing in uh, training people on Java. And uh, actually, uh, there were no other frameworks that uh, could allow us to do the, the modular application that we were dreaming about. Right. So uh, we found Vadin that is both completely uh, Java and um, allowed us from, from start to have a, a very, very modular and configurable user interface. because. The, the entire platform, as it is named, it's a platform, and on it we have a lot of different uh, web applications. One for pressure vessels, one for the electrical parts, one for risk-based inspections, or for um, operating windows. And the user interface gets built differently according to which application and plugins the user is using. Right. So let me get this straight. You're actually building for different customers. You're building different, let's say, variations of the applications together. Is that basically it? Well, we we have, uh, I think, nine on ten or ten different applications. And then we have uh, some plugins that enrich the application with features like GIS features or 3D models viewing or also 3D point cloud viewers in the web browser. And then we have customizations upon that. Uh, and the customization may change the user interface according to customers' needs or sometimes whims. Right. I, yeah, I, we always have customers that say, hey, this field, I don't want its name, I want to change the name, or I want this field, or new field to be added, or that field to be removed, removed because I'm not paying for that and so on. So we have to customize a lot of things inside. Right the user interface. How do you how do you structure development in, in that sense? So are the, these 15 people working on different parts or different applications or may, maybe even split on customers? So how is that how is that structured team wise? Is it one big team or even uh, in smaller teams? How does it work? Well, um, in history, the team was quite uh, monolithic. And last year, we opened an office in Canada. So we split the team and now we have uh, nine developers on the entire platform here in Italy and three in Canada. So we uh, split it more, uh, the development in, uh, in more than, like, in, in two different um, branches, let's say. Right. So for example, currently the Canada team is working on porting of the remaining features from the legacy application while uh, the, the Italian team is working on both customer requests and on internal projects for new features. Right, I see. Uh, ever run into any time zone issues with communication, by the way? Well, we have six hours of difference. Uh, so we, in Italy, we can talk with them only in the afternoon. Uh, Actually, one of the three in Canada wakes up at five, so we find him awake and connected to Slack at uh, half of the morning here in Italy. But don't tell it to anyone. Uh, <laughs> we're not requiring anyone to do this. <laughs> okay, I, I, find it, I find it super interesting to see. Uh, also at JetBrains, we have you know uh, people working in different countries on the same product, like in Team City, for example. Uh, it's really uh, from Holland, Germany, uh, Dublin, Ireland to Russia, and it's always interesting to see not too many different time zones there, but uh, still uh, how communication works across uh, countries, across time zones, and and, and that sort of stuff. 
Mm -hmm. I also have uh, an issue with that, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, when I uh, wake up in the morning, I have mm, 10 to 20 emails of um, issues closed in Canada that I have to review at the right. morning. So I have my, my job to do every morning on that. Yeah, when you wake up, mm, I, I see. <laughs> um, when, when you, in terms of development, um, are you using Git for version control or are you something else for version control or how do you do version control? Yeah, we use Git. Right. And in a few months ago, we moved uh, to GitHub. And um, a question that kind of splits uh, people, uh, do you do trunk-based development or, or do you do feature branch-based development or what does that look like? Or pull requests? Um... We use a variation of Git flow. So it is a feature branch based development. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we adopted Gitflow seven or eight years ago, I think, already. And it solved many issues that we had at, at that time. Uh, we say when we were young. <laughs> and we're not young anymore. <laughs> right. uh, and so we have a lot of short lived uh, feature branches. Uh, and we currently have three development branches, one for new feature, that is the develop, and a couple of hotfix branches because we have to maintain old versions for a while. Right, yeah. How many, how many new versions or what, what does a versioning scheme look like? How many new versions of the software do you bring out uh, a year, basically? Or is there like a concept like major versions, minor versions even, or do you do it on a per customer basis or what does it look like? Yeah, we have a version scheme that is a uh, three um, figures based. So we have a major that actually uh, almost never changes. It changes only for marketing reasons. <laughs> and we have a minor uh, version that uh, changes with new features and then the hotfix. So uh, for example, in these days we are at 1.32. Right. Point one is the next release, and develop is going for one point thirty three, and we're still maintaining uh, one point thirty one. Probably mm -hmm. we will switch to two when we'll have uh, big features like three um, D editing in uh, the web page. Right. That's something we're working on. Okay. Um, when it when it comes to build pipelines, what does actually a build pipeline for your platform look like? Um, well, we are using a continuous integration server. We are we we are moving to to Team CD, so um, it is all configured so that when features get closed and integrated inside the develop branch for new things or the hotfixes branch in um, for maintenance uh, issues then they are, are built by the continuous integration server you have so you you have one source repository where all the web applications live or do you have separate yeah. repositories where all these separate applications live no it is one single repo and all the applications are released with the same uh, version right Okay, so then something changes uh, on every change. You basically build all the web applications, everything gets built, uh, and I suppose also test it uh, yeah. at that point. Um, an always interesting question is, uh, do you know roughly how many tests you have and how long do your tests, or how long does testing take or how, how much time does it take? Yeah, we have, um, I don't remember the exact number, but it's between 1,800 to 1,900 test, unit tests. Uh, actually, most of them are integration tests because being a Spring Boot application, many tests uh, boot up a complete uh, Spring context. And the whole um, build and test and packaging of the application um, is, takes about a couple of hours. A couple of hours. Yeah. N not just the testing, but also the building and everything. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the whole process takes a couple of hours. Yeah. Is there anything you would say, uh, is, is there any part of that process where you could make it go faster? Does it depend on maybe it's just too that the tests are too complex, maybe it's too many integration tests? So how, where would you say uh, you could maybe improve things a tiny bit? 
Yeah, this is something that probably we are not very proud of. But <laughs> as I said, a lot of our tests are actually integration tests. So uh, I think that we'd like to do is a review of the unit test and uh, do unit tests as they should do. So use mocking beans and so on. So skipping all the time on context boots and so on. Right. Do you also do a lot of manual testing? We have a suite of manual testing that we perform uh, before any minor release. Uh, this happens uh, every three or four months. Uh, we have 300 manual tests that are performed by both developers or other people in, in the company. Right. And so it takes a few days and we had to do the test, uh, the, the, the manual test and then fix uh, common things that may come up during the tests and okay. then we can release. I see. And um, in terms of deployment, so the application gets built, uh, it gets tested, whatever. Uh, deployment, would that mean you actually also you run the service for your customers or basically do you give them like uh, deployable artifacts which they will themselves deploy then in, in their universe? Or what does a deployment actually look like when you have a new version? Well, it depends because we have uh, some customers. Well, we have few large customers. Mm -hmm. for, our customers are oil majors. Uh, so, um, and they, often they are very jealous of, our, of their data. So in many cases, we have to deploy things inside their own uh, network. And often they have their operation teams that um, simply receive the artifacts and know how to deploy them to their servers. For the other cases, we often uh, host the applications and we have automated scripts that uh, perform the, the deployment. But in every case, we have to um, ask permissions to the customer. So it is not fully automated. Right, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it would be interesting if you just swap out a new version without uh, telling uh, uh, your customers about it, right? Oh, it would be a hell because they do not want this. Yes, yeah. Um, in terms of just infrastructure-wise, so I know you move, you're moving to Team City Cloud, uh, but uh, before that, uh, just in terms of machines and computing, what what did you have before that? Now, I mean, do you have like just a, do you have a software? Sorry, your infrastructure based in the cloud partially already, or did you have some on-premise uh, hardware? Or how, what did that look like? Well, we are generally moving to uh, cloud services. Uh, um, Team City Cloud is an example. Yeah. We moved from a hosted Git to GitHub mm -hmm. um, before Christmas. And uh, uh, before that, we used a Git server inside our network and a Jenkins server inside our, our network. Right so on. we're moving both from on-prem to cloud and from a CI server to another. Well, uh, I wish you good luck with that. I'll tell you what, uh, <laughs> the, the, this has been super interesting. That was uh, nice and quick and uh, gave us a good overview of, um, of uh, what you do with the Antea platform, platform. And uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you very much for the interview, Federico. Thank you, really.